Nordic Business Forum live studio here at Circus in Stockholm. Good morning to all of our audiences who are here, and also, of course, a good morning to all our live stream viewers who are watching this via live stream and also on Facebook. My name is Sabine von Gafke, and I will be hosting conversations, hopefully interesting and compelling conversations with our speakers who are here today in the breaks from the main stage. And we really have an exciting day ahead of us. We also have a great lineup of speakers, and we have a full house. It's already buzzing here. We have 1,400 executives here ready to learn, mingle, and share their knowledge. And. Um, on the main stage, we're going to start at 1.30. However, I'm thrilled to have the honor to have one of the highlights here today in the studio now this morning. Um, he is a renowned leadership expert, an optimist, a New York Times best-selling author of four books, a brilliant mind. Of course, I'm talking about Simon Sinek. Thank you very much. Simon, welcome. Thanks for having me. This is the second time we meet. It is, We met indeed. four years ago. Um, I know you're going to talk about your forthcoming book, The Infinite Game, on stage. I don't really want to, you know, dwell too much into that. But I, I did listen to an interview, and I thought it was interesting, because you said the reality of The Infinite Game is that you're only competing with yourself. And I thought that was such a great quote. Could you just sort of elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I mean... Uh, in the infinite game, there's no finish line. Mm. There's no such thing as a winner, you know? Uh, there's no such thing as winning business, for example. And so to, to, to start the day saying, I'm gonna beat my competition based on what metrics, based on what time frame, mm. the, it, it, it actually creates more problems mm. for an organization. Um, and, but there is, a, there is still a competition and the only true competitor in the infinite game is yourself. Mm. How do we do better this year than we did last year? How do we make everything that we're doing better? Not because we're trying to outdo someone else, but we're trying to outdo mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's going to require like a mindset shift? Because in a sense, it sort of reverses everything that we might have been learned from an early stage, that it's more about competitiveness and you know, comparison with others. A hundred percent. I mean, that's exactly what I'm preaching, which is we have to change our mindset for the game in which we're actually playing, not the game we think we're playing. Mm -hmm. You can't show up, you know, uh, with a basketball to play football. It, it's, the wrong, it's the wrong rules. Yeah. Uh, so you can train all you want, but you're going to not do well. Well, imagine if we're training for a finite game, but the game we're actually playing is infinite. Yeah. It doesn't go well. And I want to take us back because we all know, presumably, that you are the man who popularized Why, mm -hmm. and uh, that became, you know, the third most seen TED Talk ever. And then you sort of updated that with uh, the interview on millennials in the workplace that I think, you know, broke the internet. And I think you have now over 200 million viewers. And I was thinking, integrating Why and purpose and millennials and taking a perspective, how are companies and corporations actually doing when we look at, you know, purpose, why, retaining and gaining talent and so forth? I think there's a, look, the fact that I have a career, mm. uh, you know, I'm embarrassed that I have a career. I talk about trust and cooperation, there should be no demand for my work. Mm. But the fact that I have a career means that there's an opportunity, that there is demand for these things. Mm. And I think uh, for the leaders with the courage to challenge the way business has been done for the past 30 years, um, they're seeing a lot of success. Mm. You know, there is no millennial problem. Um, uh, the problem we have is we have a leadership vacuum, we have a leadership problem in the world in, in too many businesses. The businesses that are well-led have no issue with their millennials. Mm. You know, every generation has its advantages and its own disadvantages, that's normal. Um, uh, but I think what, what we have too much of is bad leadership where people don't feel inspired to come to work, they don't feel safe when they're there, and they don't feel, feel fulfilled when they come home at the end of the day. That is because of leaders. It's not because of the job. It's not because of the, what the company makes. There's some pretty uh, um, you know, unromantic companies. They're not in tech that are amazing places to work. Um, I visited a company uh, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. They, 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 they uh, make aggregate, you know, quarries. They smash rocks for a living. That's what they do. And yet I met people who love their jobs and love each other and love coming to work. So there's nothing glamorous about that. 
Um, so it's really not about the product, it's about the leadership. So let's sort of dive in more into that because we talk a lot, I mean, I host a lot of conferences and, and symposiums and everybody's talking about, you know, leadership and the future of leadership. So having you here, can we sort of dive into this, which at the moment, you know, is not a problem, it, it is a solution, but it's as if there, leaders don't have the tools or the know-how or the mindset at the moment. So could you just sort of take us on that journey? What are the traits? What are the components that are needed? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges is that leadership is a skill. It's a learnable, teachable, practicable skill. And if we don't teach people the skill, they won't know how to do it. When somebody is junior in their job, we give them tons of training how to do their job. Of course. Otherwise, they won't be able to do it. And if they're really good at their job, we'll promote them. And eventually, they'll be promoted to a position where they now are responsible for the people who do the job they used to do. Mm -hmm. But we don't teach people how to lead. We just promote people because they were good at the other job. And so we get managers and not leaders because we don't teach people how to lead. We're not teaching them how to lead at school. We're not teaching them how to lead in business school. And so it's left to the companies themselves to have to teach leadership because people are just ill-prepared. Mm -hmm. Um, so, the, like I said, anybody, it's like being a parent. Mm. Everybody has the capacity to be a leader. Doesn't mean we all want to be leaders, and doesn't mean we all should be leaders. We, we all have the capacity for it. And it's not about the promotion. Mm. You know, having the kid takes five minutes. Raising the kid takes decades. You know, it's a lifestyle to choose the choice to become a parent. It's not the promotion, that takes five minutes. It's the lifestyle of becoming a leader that I think most people are unaware of when they, when they accept the responsibility. So what are the traits that, that make a good leader? Is it sort of more shifting toward the soft skills or is it having more 360 degree of both having yeah. tech and, and, and knowing sort of every part of the organization? Yeah, so I hate the term soft skills because mm. there's nothing soft about them. They're, they're human true. skills. They're human, human skills. skills. And, check that. And, and leadership is about human skills. So true. Um, uh, there is no correlation between how good you are at the job and how good a leader you are. Mm. Because one is about doing the job and one is about creating a space in which others are good at the job. Mm. Um, so uh, um, the best leaders have high EQ. The best leaders understand the human skills. They're good at listening. They're good at empathy. They're good at patience. Mm. Um, they're good at um, creating a space in which they can help other people feel accountable. And if they fall or falter, they say, good, try again. Um, uh, they believe in people. Yeah. They practice trust, which means they trust first. They don't ever say, give me a reason why I should trust you. Leaders must bestow trust. It's the risk of trust. Mm -hmm. So all of these things require risk and patience and arbitrary time frames don't help, you know, because you can't predict those kinds of results. You can't predict how long it takes to make a friend. You can't predict how long it takes to fall in love. Well, you can't predict how long trust and cooperation develop inside a company. Mm. And so the number one characteristic I think required to be a leader is courage. It's incredibly hard. Mm. It's sometimes thankless, it's sometimes lonely. Mm. Um, sometimes the results cannot meet arbitrary deadlines. Mm. All of these things require risk and all of these things require courage. And I'm thinking, because a lot of the time, just sticking a little bit more to leadership, a lot of the time you also refer to leadership in the army. Um, where people might have one perspective that it's very much, you know, yeah. um, but, but you sort of say that, that it is actually the perfect way to transition into leadership in the corporate world. Well, the military has very good examples of good leadership and they have very good examples of bad leadership. I think the private sector does as well. Um, I think what makes the military a good, a, a good case study for me is that the lessons are exaggerated. Um, that because very often the stakes really are life and death, that all of the lessons of good leadership are much easier to see. In business, it's not life and death, but all of leadership is exactly the same, maybe harder to see. Mm. What's very funny is we make movies about bad leaders, mm. right? Where somebody is screaming and barking orders and telling everybody what to do, and they swoop in and save the day. It makes a great movie. It makes a terrible organization. Mm. And so if we're modeling ourselves after leaders in the movies, we're off to a bad start. Mm. Good leaders, they don't make movies about good leaders because they're boring. Because everything kind of works fine and everybody's taking care of each other and you can walk in and say, where's the boss? And they go, oh, I, I don't know. I'm not even sure she came in today. Like, mm. you know, and, and so we tend to make m movies about bad leaders. Mm. Um, uh, but uh, 
I, I think the military, for me, has been a remarkable education. Um, there, it's an incredibly human place. I've cried with more people in uniform than I've ever cried with in suits. I've hugged more people in uniform than I've ever hugged people in suits. It's a very, very human organization. Mm. Uh, the Marine Corps talks about the intangibles mm. as core to what makes Marines strong. They talk about love mm. as core to what makes the Marine Corps strong. Mm. You would never talk about those words you would never use the word love to describe a great organization in business. Yet the Marine Corps, I would argue, is much more uh, powerful than most businesses. Um, and like I said, the intangibles is what we would call human skills. And, and because what, what I like also is you talk a lot about sort of human relationship, human connection, yeah. human skills, and the importance to also integrate that with, you know, the emerging technology and so forth. We're more connected than ever, but yeah. it's humans somehow more disconnected than ever. And, and I also know that you, you, you sort of correlated that to the healthcare system where you said, you know, there's so many people there working, caring for patients, but they're in their turn are not being cared for. Right. And, and that's why the system is broken. And it sort of felt like a fundamental view of how the world is also working within corporates. How can we sort of shift and try to tackle this, you know, with the really endorsing a good culture, having employee satisfaction, retaining talent, and so forth? Well, we have to, we have to, there's multiple things we have to do. It's the law of diffusion is king here. We're, mm. we're looking for early adopters. Mm. I'm out there preaching what leadership has to look like, offering some tools. Um, and it's the early adopters, it's the ones with the courage to say, I'm gonna do it differently than, than the norm. Just because it's normal doesn't mean it's correct. Um, it just means it's normal. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the forward thinking leaders who, think, who say, I believe in the theory, I believe in putting people before numbers. Um, I believe in good leadership and creating a space in which people can work to their natural best. And the more of those early adopters we get, eventually we will tip the whole system and completely change the way business is done. And, and remember, this is not a new idea. Mm -hmm. Business and leadership has really been in decline for the past 30, 40 years since the late 1970s. There was no such thing as mass layoffs to balance the books mm -hmm. on an annualized basis prior to the 1980s. There was no such thing as shareholder supremacy as a theory where we prioritize the wants exactly. and needs of the shareholders over the customer and the employee. That did not exist prior to the 1970s. Rank and yank, all of these ridiculous ideas where you promote the top 10% and fire the bottom 10%. These are all ridiculous ideas that were really promoted in the 80s and 90s that have become normalized today, but they've come at great expense. We've had multiple stock market crashes in the past 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. We've had the decline of trust. We've had the decline of innovation. We've had the decline of cooperation. We've even seen the decline of the, the lifespan of a business. Yep. In the 1950s, the average lifespan of a business was 60 years. Today, it's 18, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we, it's come, and, it, and, and the economy is not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I would argue that that those systems were perfectly fine for the short term. They were finite-minded. Uh, and quite frankly, it's time for us to reject that thinking and embrace what capitalism really is and should be, which is people-focused. Yeah. What Adam Smith envisioned it was much more people focused than what we have today. And, and one can feel there is a transition more to that and also impact with profit and so forth. It's slowly getting there. Slowly the, the momentum there. is on our side. And as time is ticking, I just wanted to ask because Simon Sinek is all about purpose and, and, and mission and why. So what is Simon Sinek's purpose and mission and why? What's your own purpose and so mission? So I have a cl very clear vision of the world I would like to live in. Mm. I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe at work, and return home fulfilled at the end of the day. Mm. And I've devoted my entire professional life to, to try and preach what that world could look like and, and do everything I can to try build it. So just to summarize for all the leaders and all the entrepreneurs who are here and also online, what are the three key insights they should think about to try and transition into that vision? Uh, number one, people come first. Uh, number two, have the, the courage to do the right thing rather than the expedient thing. Mm. And, and number three, embrace an infinite mindset. It's about thinking way beyond any fixed time frames. Well, we look forward to listening to you on stage to hear more about the infinite mindset. Simon, thank you so much. Give a round welcome of applause to Simon Sinek. Thank, thank you.
So before I introduce my next guest, I just want to mention to all of you here that the doors have opened to the seminar, if you to the seminar hall. If you want to reserve a seat, please do that, or otherwise just stay here. Um, it starts at 1.30, and I'll be now introducing my next guest, who is um, Marco, thank you, Marco Bertini, marketing professor at Barcelona's ESEAD Business School. And Marco also held a VIP session earlier today for some of the VIPs and speakers, and let's see if we can have him here and talk a bit about setting price and uh, other models of what he calls the ends, the end game, how technology is revolutionizing the basis of commerce. And what one could think about is how is exponential technology having an impact on commerce? Well, hopefully, Marco is coming, yeah? Marco, welcome. Marco Bertini, you come fresh off the stage of having Indeed. a VIP session. Indeed. Now, I don't think our online viewers had a chance to <laughs> view the VIP session, so can you just give some key takeaways that you think would be of value for them? So the, uh, the session was a session ultimately about technology mm -hmm. um, and how technology is changing the very nature or the very fiber of commerce, mm -hmm. um, specifically, uh, we have exchange with customers, and as a firm, we're typically used to selling them things, right? We're we used to selling them products, we're used to selling them services. Uh, and it's fine for us because, we you know, the risk is on the customer. If it doesn't perform, so be it, right? You bought it, right? Maybe there's a guarantee in place. But um, the technology bit is that, increasingly, we're able to actually understand consumption, which we couldn't do before. We left the product with the customer, and that's it. We didn't know what was happening. But now we have sensors. And these sensors can tell us how consumption, when consumption is happening, how it's happening, and it can even tell you the outcomes of that consumption. So when you've got that opportunity, I was telling the audience, the market is much more efficient because you've got a customer that wants something and it can maybe be charged only for that something. That's as efficient as it gets. So when you have this, this opportunity, this efficiency, I was telling my audience, that's an opportunity to grow your market, to, to get more revenue, to lower your costs. Flip the, the knife over, the other side of the knife was, or the sword, is the opportunity is there. If you don't take it, somebody else will, for sure. So you have to be kind of careful. Yeah, it's always... And, go on, so I was just saying that then I, in the presentation, I showed them examples from anything from uh, industrial explosives to comedy theaters, to healthcare, to education. All of these markets are moving at a pretty steady state towards those uh, outcome-based models. Mm. And, and I know, which you also mentioned, you specialize in pricing, right. and you've also stated that there are only four ingredients that matter when setting a price. Yes. So which are these four? Absolutely. So when you're setting a price, uh, it's actually, it's pretty easy to understand what they are. I call them the four Cs, uh, costs, competition, customers, and your company goals. Mm. So typically what I, would, what I would talk about is how these ingredients are logical, and you understand, and we kind of use them in some way, mm -hmm where the problems arise is at the moment of actually integrating that information. Mm. So for example, we rely way too much on our costs when we price something. We don't rely way enough on our customers when we price something. We think way too much about our competition. We like agonize over, we have like voodoo dolls and we, you know, we agonize about competitors. No, don't do that. Uh, and we're often in conflict with, with, between ourselves in the company as to what the objectives actually are. Mm. So, Finding a way to integrate that information properly is kind of the secret sauce there. And you also, I know that you pointed out that generating revenue is as much about creativity and strategy yes. as it is about dollars and coins. Right. Yes. So, so exemplify yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I say that is because, from the one hand, um, most organizations that I've had the pleasure to work with, they tend to um, see pricing as a very tactical thing. Mm -hmm. Me as a psychologist by training, I see prices as lots of meaning. Mm -hmm. So they have, they're of course numbers, but they're also information. We learn, you learn, I learn a lot from prices in the marketplace. What is the quality? Mm -hmm. What is the company trying to tell me? Mm -hmm. And also price, the way we price can set certain relationships with customers. So the moment you know that a price has this kind of impact on customers, it becomes, it moves from being a short term, let me capture money from them, tactical thing to, uh, hold on a second, long term, let me manage demand over time. Mm. What do I want to tell my customers about my brand? Mm. 
what kind of relationships do I want? And the moment you start using it that way, it becomes strategy and it becomes creativity and it ensures that your demand is sustainable uh, over time. And, and looking at sort of the whole marketing spectrum, I mean, today we, we talk more about gaining a fan or, or someone who really, you know, endorses the brand as opposed to just gaining a conversion. So, so what, what are sort of the metrics that, that are coming more to really get a brand to be positioned to a target group and not just to have a conversion for them? From, a, from my perspective? Yeah. Well, so, okay, so it's a bit of an intricate question, as you ask. So there, there, Ultimately, a company has two sort of aspects when it comes to its customers. It has the creation of value perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Where the branding comes into it. Mm -hmm. And then it has the capturing of value perspective where we try to convert that into revenue, mm -hmm. right? What we fail to do properly is measure, is integrate those two things. Mm -hmm. When we don't integrate those two things properly, you have this problem that you're mentioning, mm -hmm. okay? So the metrics that you want to think about are things like customer lifetime value. So what is the value of your customer exactly. and your brand over time, as opposed to short-term metrics? Mm. Um, and also, sometimes the more softer measures about beliefs and attitudes of your customers, because those fuel the brand uh, over time. And, and how is technology, especially exponential technology with AI, with VR, you talked about sensors and so yes. forth, how is that sort of coming to revolutionize or impact My world? You know, the basis of com commerce and yeah. your world? Um, so the way I think about it is, is I start narrow and I, get, and I get broad. So if you think about technology, technology in commerce is transparency. Yeah. Right? Ultimately, to me, it's transparency. That transparency then becomes different things. It becomes um, accountability, which is what I was talking about before. Mm. Uh, if it's transparent, my exchange with you, I need to be more accountable. If I tell you I'm going to give you X, why am I not... If I'm a customer, why am I not paying for X? Why am I paying for anything but X, right? Mm. So the accountability comes into it. Um, automation. Mm. I can understand my competitor's prices instantly, and I couldn't do so before. Mm. By the way, if I want to, I can also have robots do my competitive bidding against competitors mm. at the same time. So automation is changing a little bit the way we approach the, pro the, the, the process. Um, it is changing also fundamentally decision-making. Right? Uh, especially a topic like mine, it's full of heuristics and biases. Right? It's full of, because it's hard to understand you know, numbers and Excel spreadsheets, uh, so we tend to resort to heuristics. With, with lots of technology and lots of transparency, you can replace that heuristics with some more proper decision rules. Mm. And do you see anything, because today also, if you look within commerce, it's going so much more from offline to online, of course. Right. And, and how do you see that transition? What, what do you think, are they going to um, weigh in on each other or is one going to exclude the other? Um, I would like to know that. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think as a marketing professor, I suppose, my, my, my standard is always the customer. Mm. Um, the offline-online dichotomy has changed a lot over time. It used to be the case that we're offline, we go online, but we tell the customer what to do. Mm. No, you look there, but you buy here, right? And you don't pay more here, you pay more here, right? Things like this. Um, but of course, the customer says, no, 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 I want to have my journey, my experience, the way I want it. And the customer always wins because the customer has the money. If you don't win here, they go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so companies have started doing this omni-channel idea where you try to integrate all of these channels into one, into one uh, experience. The pricing angle of it has been one of the last ones to change because companies are very, very hesitant. They're always asking me, for example, one of the big questions is, what should I do with my online prices? Should it be the same as offline? And the long answer to your question is, uh, it, the, the relative weight of these things will depend ultimately on the customer journey itself. Mm. But whatever the customer feels comfortable with, um, that is the best way to structure the journey. And maybe that offline is more, exp it's an experience that you create and online is maybe more the purchase. I, I, well, it can, I don't know, it, can, it could be, uh, it definitely could be. It can also be functional, right? We've seen recently um, in the retail sector, for example, companies saying, yes, yes, shop online, get your security online, compare online. But by the way, if you buy online, you're not getting the product today. And it's if you want, that's very functional, right? If you want the thing now, go to my store and get it. So you can see how 
It really depends on the nature of that experience, in my opinion. And with your know-how, what would you say are the three key future marketing trends that we can see, let's say, in three to five years, because everything goes so quickly now? So, uh, with, 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 with permission, I would like to uh, list one of the things that I talk about as, yeah. as one of those trends. So, to me, the, a clearer trend is this change in the way we generate revenue, as I was mentioning to the audience, between uh, ownership to outcomes. It's, it's, to me, it's perfectly clear, and I see it in all, in all sorts of marketplaces. That would be number one, one of the three. Um, another one, I think, is um, the use of analytics. Mm. It's just, I mean, it's cliche almost to say it by now, but it's, but it's, I mean, when you're there, you see it, it's completely revolutionizing the way organizations work. Even, I work for a business school, so even how business schools work. Um, the functions within companies, disciplines within business schools are basically merging into one. Right, um, and then number three, I think, also fueled by technology, is the, is the sheer efficiency mm. that it's creating on the on the operation side, mm. uh, the ability to make your uh, your company run as as smooth as it possibly can. And I was also thinking, coming to pricing, because I think this was also a question that, that someone in the audience wanted me to address to you, and that was sort of a question on on discounting. How do you sort of discount intelligently um, from a long long-term point right. of view. So um, there's a few things you want to do. So this, I think the very first thing you want to do, with discounting, it's, it's a very tricky animal. Mm -hmm. um, discounting, most of us as companies go into it because we feel we have to. Uh, we kind of would like to stop, but once you get in that cycle, it's like a, you know, like a prisoner's dilemma. It's very hard to get out of it, right? So it's a bit of a love-hate relationship. So with discounting, what you want to do is you don't want to stop, you don't want to do too much of it. What you want to do is you get essentially, and it's kind of logical to say this, mm. you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. Of course. Right? So, now, logical to say, in practice, what this means is that if I'm going to do some discounting, I don't want to stop at, did the customer buy me because of the discount? I want to do something else with it. Mm. It's an opportunity, for example, depending on the sector, to build my brand. Mm. I have the customer's attention because the, the discount attracted them to me, well, okay, how do I structure the discount in such a way that actually reinforces the behaviors that are consistent with my brand? Mm. Um, so, for example, an example that comes to mind, if I, uh, if I sell health insurance and, when I, and I want to do some discounts to grow my marketplace, don't just give money, people to, money to people. Um, maybe make them give a discount conditional on them running more, walking more, eating apples, whatever it might be. That's consistent with my brand, right? I want people to live a healthier life. I reward you. Instead of discount, I reward you for living a healthier life. So you sort of change the incentive. You change the narrative, yeah, yeah. in a sense. Which is right. so important. Right. And are there any challenges that you find are easy um, to shift into solutions, just quickly before we end, that you would like to convey? Um, to a few challenges, uh, data being one of them. If you don't have data to start with, you mm. cannot do anything, okay? No. Uh, about consumption patterns. Uh, another big one is getting over yourself. Uh, so, uh, it, what I mean by that, and I, I, called, I talked about this in the session, I, yeah. I called it the quality paradox. Um, paradoxically, the companies who, who are better at creating value, they innovate more, they spend on R&D, they're really into, they're actually the least likely at the moment to look, think about outcomes, because there's so much in their heads in the about head. their products and services, how great their pills are, how great their televisions are, and so, and so it's very hard for them to empathize with customers, one, and two, because they've spent so much money, they tend to be much more conservative. Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure they recover their costs, so they're very much inward looking. So that's a big challenge for me. That's a big challenge. Big topic. Big topic. And what are you most looking forward to today? Any uh, listen topic? to the other speakers. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I know my, uh, my speech and yeah. my message, and I, I try to convey it as best as possible, but I mean, the lineup here is, is great. I'm looking forward to listening to them and the quality of the audience and their comments. Well, sure. Marco Bertini, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your insights, and thank the best of luck going forward. And do come back and join us of next course. time. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, you, you very much. And uh, to all our live viewers, as you can hear, there are bells ringing, which means that soon it's time. In a few seconds, it's time for me to hand over to the main stage. The main stage starts at 1.30. I and the live studio will be back again at 3.25, where I will be uh, having conversations with four of the speakers. And um, in the in the meantime, do watch the live streaming and also the Facebook live streaming. And I hope that in just about 20 seconds, 
Everything will be moving and shaking on the stage that will start off with Isabella Löfengrip, who is a Swedish multi-entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, and who's here to convey her knowledge on how to drive businesses to success. So with that, I hand over to the main stage. Just allowed us to 